Where do we start to fix it, to make it right? To make a difference between true Islam and cultural Islam. The starting point, as the Prophet ﷺ used to say in his speeches, he would begin it after praising Allah, etc., saying, Inna asdaq al hadith kitabullah. The most truthful form of speech is the book of Allah. He would always begin with that reminder. So this is where we need to begin. We need to get back to the Quran and to understand it and to bring it into our lives to play a primary role in our day-to-day -day lives that currently is missing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran speaking about the time of the Prophet وسلم, and of times to come. He stated in Surah Al-Furqan, that's the 25th chapter, verse 30, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّي إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا The Messenger said, Allah said, the Messenger said, O oh my Lord, indeed my people have boycotted this Quran. Indeed, my people have boycotted this Quran. As Allah told us, Quran am ala That was Allah's reminder. Will they not reflect on the Quran? Or are their hearts closed up? Locked up? Kufu is a lock and truly today our hearts have become locked that is the reality of the Muslim world today our hearts have been locked up from the Quran so we need to open up our hearts the way is through understanding the Quran reading it and reflecting on its meanings whether it is in Ramadan or outside of Ramadan, our goal is to understand the words of Allah. Better we read a little and understand a lot than to read a lot and understand little. That's, I think, obvious mathematics. We try to read and understand as much as we can. Are we the slaves of God? Are we slaves? We are the slaves of God. No, we are not the slaves of God. That is the main title. Uh, the misconception people usually have is to term those as slaves of God, which is wrong. It is, it is totally a wrong thing to do, to tell you as a slave of God, because you are not a slave, you are, you are a servant. Uh, somebody who doesn't understand this notion will say, what do you mean by this? I thought, I thought we were slaves. No, you are not a slave. <laughs> a slave is taken against his own will, right? When somebody becomes a slave, it's not for, for their will to become a slave. And a slave doesn't have a free choice. Neither does he have a free will. That is a slave. So contrary to all this, we see that it goes against the norms that God has set forth for us to term ourselves as slaves. We are not slaves to God. So if if you are terming yourself as a slave of God, please kindly refrain from that because it is a wrong perception. 
you are not the slave of God. A slave doesn't <laughs> a, a, a slave doesn't have a choice. A slave doesn't have free will. A slave is taken against his own will. That is what a slave is. And a slave is owned without his will. Do you see? Uh -huh. But when we say servant, if you are a servant to someone, it's by your own will, and you earn a reward for what you are serving. See, and you have a free will if you are a servant of somebody. You can decide to quit today whilst you are serving that person. You can decide to stop serving the person today. Or you can decide to keep serving. You have choices to make. That is servant. We say slave. Excuse me to say, you will be an ignorant person to term yourself as the slave of God. You are not a slave. See in uh, the, the notion in Quran, uh, is it Surah Al-Balad? La uqusimu bihalad wa antan hillum bihaz al-balad. Then he says, wa walidin wa ma walad. That is chapter 90 of the Quran, right? It clearly denotes and tells the believers, la uqusimu bihaz al-balad, by the balad they live in, right? Wa hillu balad. You are free, you, you, anta, and you will be free uh, in this land. Wa walidin wa ma walad. You understand? So both the, the parents and the children, whether a father, a son, whether a mother and a daughter, are all free, right? Uh -huh. So to, to term yourself as a slave, it, it all breaks down to how words work in the Quran. And that is what I'm going to help people to understand this notion today, right? Uh -huh. So today I'm, I'm streaming live both on Facebook, uh, on my page, Correctional Officer, and then streaming, uh, streaming live the Correctional Officer on YouTube channel, right? So you can get me both on both platforms streaming live at the same time, right? Okay, so we are not the slaves of God. That is the title of today's discussion, right? So when we say, uh, for instance, in the Quran, you see the word abda, abdi, abdu. You see the word abid, abid, and so on. Now, this word has multiple meanings. It's not only limited to one meaning, as people perceive it to be, right? So when you take a word in the Arabic Quran, they have different meanings. It's not only one meaning always. You have to check the subject, the context, and the content itself. So before I start today's uh, uh, topic, بَرَعُوزُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنَ قَوْلًا مِنْ مَنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَأَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّ لِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ and who is better in speech than one who invites to Allah and act righteous and says, Indeed, I am of the submitters. Hazi sabili adu ilallah ala basiratin ana wa mani tabani wa subhanallahi wa ma ana min al mushirkin. This is my way I invite to Allah by perception. I am whoever follows me and glory be to Allah for I am not among the idolaters. That's the mushriks. Alhaqqum min rabbikum fa man sha'a falyu'min wa man sha'a falyakhfur. The truth is from your Lord, so whoever wills, let him believe, and whoever wills, let him disbelieve. Ya you lazina amanu taqullah wa kunu as O you who believe, beware of God and be with those who are truthful. That is, those who are honest, swadiki. Now, moving on to the topic, today's topic. When I said we are not the slaves of God, and I put quote and quote, we are going to understand why we are not the slaves of God, Right? So if you take the Arabic Quran, always when you are dealing with a, a, a particular notion in the Quran, deal with the subject. <clears throat> Sometimes we can term it as, as a topic. You can say mawdu. In Arabic, we say mawdu. Mawdu. Now, what is mawdu? Mawdu is the thin or area being discussed. The thin or area being discussed. That is mawdu. You can see subject, you can see topic. Uh, then we have what we call siyak al-kalam. Siyak al-kalam is uh, what we call context in English. A discourse is a discourse that surrounds a language unit 
and helps to determine its interpretation, right? So you have to first understand what the topic of discussion or subject of discussion, that is the maudu. From maudu, you move to the what, what we call the context, right? Now, when you connect the context and the subject together, you are going to have what we call muhtawa. Muhtawa is what we call in English content. C-O-N-T-E-N-T. -E content. Now, what is a content? Content is what a communication is about. The information conveyed or area of interest. So you can see in line, these are somewhat similar. They are connected to each other in order to give you the, uh, the, you know, the whole picture of what you are talking about. So the team or area being discussed, discuss that surrounds a language unit and helps to determine its interpretation, what a communication is about, the information conveyed or area of interest. So all these things will let you understand what is being said in the Quran. Now, when we, when we take a word in the Quran, a word in the Quran can have one or more meanings. It can have multiple meanings based on the subject, the context, and the content of discussion in the Quran. So take note of that. Bear in mind the subject, the context, and the content of the Quran will let you understand what is being discussed. So take note. Now, if I take you to Quran chapter 16, verse 75, uh, maybe I might share the screen, let's see, but let's start with Quran, Surah Al-Nahal, chapter 6, verse 75. <clears throat> Surah Al-Nahal, chapter of the B, then we go to verse uh, 75. Uh, let's, let's see if I can share the screen, uh, and people will get to see what I'm talking about, yeah. Uh, salam Adriana Bonita, Aziz, uh, Salam Kinfaris, Yusuf Jamiu, Musa Shahib, Book of Huda, uh, Fite Maldives. Salam you all, thank you all for coming. I share the screen, let's see what it says, right? Yeah. So, here goes the verse. I don't know if it's clear enough. Let me try to increase the size of the page. Yeah. So God says, Dorabba Allahu mathalan abdan mamluka. Right? Dorabba Allahu mathalan abdan mamluka. This abda, or we can say abdi, or abdu. This abda, you see here, this word, abdan, this abdan, right? It has multiple meanings. It's not only limited to one meaning. However, we are. this is the subject of discussing. The subject is the abdan. That is the subject we are talking about. We are going to denote what, what the context will give us in order to understand the content. So I'm using three formulas. The formula is subject, context, and content. So let's let's see how it works. Quran chapter 16 verse 75. Daraba Allahu mathalan abdan mamluka la yaqdiru ala shay'in. Ah, la yaqdiru ala shay'in. Wa man razaqnahu minna rizqan hasana. Fa huwa yunfiku minhu sirran wa jahran. Hal yastaun God is asking a question. Then God says, Alhamdulillahi bal aktharahum la ya'lamun. Now the verse is simply telling us, God cites an example of, an, uh, we can say abdan, I'm not going to translate, translate it yet, but you, you get to understand that. God gave two comparisons about a word, a particular word, one word in the Quran, but he's using two comparisons to let you understand the notion of that word. Because one word can, has, can have multiple meanings. So when God says, God cites an example of an abdan. This abdan is an Arabic word. You know, many people, most people, some people will say slave, some people will say servant, some people will say subordinate, whatever you want to say. But we will come to that. Then God says, mamlukan. This word mamlukan denotes that this servant or this slave is owned. His owned, right? Mamluka is owned. 
Now we all know a slave is owned, same like a servant is owned, but they are two different things altogether, right? Good. So now, then God says, and not capable of anything. So this first Abdel, God is talking about, he is owned and not capable of anything. Not capable, meaning that that entity who is owned does no free will, right, to do things. And one whom we have provided for him. Now God is making a comparison of the same word Abdan, which is the subject. Then God says, compared to one whom we had provided for him good sustenance from us. And he disperses from it. He, the Abdan, disperses this, uh, this sustenance from it secretly and publicly, meaning by his own choice, free will. Are they equal? This, this word Abdan, those two things, criteria God described, are they equal? This Abdan and this Abdan, are they equal? The answer is no. Do you get it? The answer is no. Then God says, praise be to God. In fact, most of them do not know. Who are the them? The people. Now, the reason why I'm using this verse to set the criteria is, in the Arabic Quran, one word can have multiple meanings. However, you have to understand the subject of discussion and understand the context of discussion and you understand the content. If you have a, a sentence without having the subject, you can never know the context because you can, you can misconstrue everything about the context and put your own context. You get what I mean? Last time I made a video, I was teaching about how context and subject works in the quran if let's say right now i'm talking about football right with a friend he knows what i'm talking about he knows we are talking about football right then all of a sudden i just bring the notion of uh the word kill we all know in english the word kill k-i-l-l -L, does not ha only have one meaning it has multiple meanings right so then i said barcelona must kill madrid right i'm telling my friend he knows what we are talking about because the subject of discussion is barcelona and real madrid right so i said barcelona must kill real madrid right so as soon as i said that then again i repeated the statement but this time i used the pronoun i didn't use the, the the entity's name i didn't say barcelona or madrid anymore so i just said they have to kill them so whilst i kept saying they have to kill them a friend just walked inside the room into the room and he heard me saying they have to kill them or they must kill them. So as soon as he comes inside, you see, he doesn't know the subject of discussion. He only came and heard they have to kill them. So now because of the word kill, if he has to put it in, into his own context, not our context, his own context, he might be thinking we are talking about murder, like somebody should go and kill somebody. Do you see? Because the subject has been left out. So now he thinking, I said they have to kill them. He might go somewhere else and tell somebody, hey, guess what? I heard Baba Shraib is telling uh, this brother that they have to go and kill somebody. Somebody has to go and kill somebody. I think they are talking about the lady. The ladies over there, they have to go and kill. You understand? So he will put his own context now. So now the content has been missing. That is what we call muhtawa in, English, in Arabic. Muhtawa what a communication is about. Then I was talking about uh, how somebody will take the con your words out of context or what you mean out of context without understanding the subject. So then the, the person will now say, "Less." Uh, I heard a uh, tribe saying they have to go and kill somebody. You know, meanwhile, I wasn't talking about real killing, murder. I was talking about football. So the football, putting... Putting the word kill in that context and subject is about not a physical killing. It's about a football entertainment that some a team has to win another team. So now the content is missing. This content is what a communication is about. You understand? So without understanding the subject, without understanding the context, without understanding the content, you are out of coverage area. So the chapter 16, verse 75, I quoted, has to do with the what? 
so yeah chapter 16 verse 75 i quoted has to do with the the word abden which is the subject of discussion this abden in arabic it can mean servant it can mean slave right now in some context in the quran yes it means slave then in some context in the quran it means servant in that instance it doesn't mean slave so God made the comparison in this verse to let you understand the notion of the free will. One has and one doesn't have. The one with the free will, we don't term it as a slave. We tell him, we term him as a what? A servant. Whilst the other one doesn't have the free will, is being controlled, and that is a slave. So God says, God cites an example of a servant or Abden who is owned and not capable of anything so that becomes a slave and one whom we have provided for him good sustenance from us and he disperses from it meaning he gives charity from it secretly and publicly by his own will are they equal in comparison are they equal no they are not praise be to god in fact most of them do not do that's most of the people now verse 76 in that same chapter 76 now makes a comparison of two people two men two people right so god says uh let me let me see i can share the screen again uh quran chapter 16 verse 76 then god went ahead to say so now God is now giving another example and saying another example by God. God cites another example, right? Rajulaini, that is two men. One of them is what? Dumb. Which who is not capable of anything. Do you see? Who is not capable of anything? You see? Then God says, And he is a burden. He becomes like a, like how will I say? Something of a, uh exhausting because when something is a burden for you you are exhausted by it right so he becomes exhausting to his master the one who owns him you see then god now says god is now telling us about these two people making the comparison wahuwa wahuwa kulla ala wahuwa kullun ala maulahu aina ma yuhajji Wherever he directs him, he lets him face. He will not bring any good. That is a useless person, right? He has a master who directs him to do what something, to go here, to go here. No results. No good coming out. So God is asking, Is he equal to the one who are woman? Ya'amuru bil adli. Is he equal to the one who commands to what? Justice. Or commands with justice. Wahuwa ala siratin mustaqim. While he's upon the straight path, is he equal? The one owned by his master. When the master directs him to something, he brings no good. He's just useless. Then another man who is what? Who commands with justice. And at the same time, he is upon the straight path. Can you compare these two men? No, it means one is what dumb and one is useful. Do you see how it works? Uh -huh. So same goes with the notion of the abden. When we say abden in Arabic, it can mean a slave, it can mean a servant. You have to understand the subject of discussion and the context and content being put in so that you can decipher what it denotes in here, right? Same word with the word zakat. 
Same with the word salat. Same with the word ayat. Same, it goes on and on with the word haram. They have multiple meanings. It doesn't always mean the same thing. Just because you see the word kill here doesn't always mean when you see kill in any other sentence, it means go and kill somebody. Or when you see the word fight, when God says, and go and fight those who do not believe in God. When then they see the word fight, they think, oh, God is saying we should take knives and bombs and guns to go and fight. No, not always. Please, not always. Especially in the Quran, one word can have multiple meanings. You need to understand the context of discussion, context, subject, and content. Please. Good. Let's move on. So now, when we say a slave, let me let me put this word uh, here the word slave when we say slave number one a person who is owned by someone no free will no no choice you didn't decide to be owned when you are a slave you don't decide for the owner to own you he can capture you and own you he can buy you and own you you don't decide the owner you don't have a choice by serving this this owner he decides how you have to serve him. You don't have a choice. That makes you a slave. The second meaning, someone entirely. Now, this is what I want people to pay attention to. Someone entirely, entirely dominated by some influence or person. That is a slave. Entirely. There's no room for your own, you know, ideologies or anything. You are entirely dominated. For instance, when you when you sign up as a worker for a company, you become a servant for the company. You don't become a slave. You have a break time. You have your closing time. You can go home. You understand? When you are sick, you stay home. You have holidays. That cannot be classified as a slave. Do you see? But in Arabic, we use the same word, abda, or abdi, or something. We use the same word, abd. Just because it's used apt doesn't mean it means you are a slave. Just because you are working for somebody and you are apt. No. You don't become a slave in that context. You are a servant. And I'll be coming to that. So someone entirely dominated by some influence or a person becomes a slave. Entirely. You check the word. Entirely. You are owned. You don't have a free will. You don't have a free choice. You become a slave in that moment. Then now we have what we call a servant. And when we say a servant, a servant is a person working in the service of an under. Just like we go to the work, workplaces, we work and we get paid. You have a free will to either work or quit. You have a free will for your break time to decide what you are going to do with your break time. You see, you have a free choice to make whilst you're serving somebody you are just in a subordinate position that is it you see a servant but you see this word abdan in arabic because we are dealing with an arabic word now we have to decipher in order to know the different choices is being used the meanings where it means this and where it means that so now I'm going to decipher to tell you, to show you how when a particular word in Arabic is used in a certain context and subject, it can mean that, but in that given time, it doesn't mean the opposite. You see, so now the same word Abdan gives you a servant and gives you a slave. We are not the slaves of God. Yes, we are the servants of God. You see the difference? Good. Now, what I'm going to do next is, I'm going to take the word slave, the same word abda. Hmm? If you go to Quran chapter 23, verse 45 to verse 47, chapter 23, verse 45 to verse 47, I'm going to show you where it is used in the notion of slaves. You remember Pharaoh? And his people, how they enslaved the children of Israel, right? So when you go to Quran chapter 23, verse 45 to verse 47, and they said, 
Should we believe two men? You remember when Moses and his brother Aaron were sent as messengers to Pharaoh? Should we believe two men like us because they are men? Like us, while their people are our slaves, Abidun, Lana Abidun. This Abidun means slaves in this context. Because they were enslaving the children of Israel. The children of Israel don't like to serve them. They were rather taken against their own will. They own them, so they force them to do what they want. You understand? That in that context, you don't become a servant. You become a slave to the other party, the one who owns you, because he, they decide what they have to do with you. So that is why God sent Moses and Aaron to go and free the children of Israel away from Pharaoh in order for them to liberate themselves and become free from slavery. So if God of all people would rather give you the free will to make decisions, why will he look for another person to enslave you? God doesn't condone slavery. The second me, uh, example, Quran chapter 26, verse 15 to verse 22. When you read downwards, you see the context is talking about the children of Israel and Pharaoh's people. When the children of Israel were enslaved, this was what Moses told them. Right? Now, Moses said to Pharaoh, and these were favors which you oblige me in order to enslave the children of Israel. The word used in Arabic is what? Abatta. 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 It means to enslave. Right? Uh -huh. So Pharaoh used that to enslave the children of Israel by giving a particular favors, thinking that, oh, they have a chance with them. No, no, no. He is going to enslave you with that because then he doesn't give you free will. As we see some of our people face from Africa, when they travel overseas and go to the Middle Eastern countries, they go to Saudi Arabia, they go to uh, Qatar, they go to United Arab Emirates. What they do? They seize their passports and force them to work in their houses. No free will. You don't decide to go where you, where you want. You become a slave in that context. You don't become a servant. A servant has a choice to make. A slave doesn't have a choice and doesn't have a free will whether they don't like the boss or not. You see the difference? Uh -huh. So this is what Pharaoh did to the children of Israel. He enslaved them because they didn't have a choice and they were owned entirely by Pharaoh. So God has to send Moses in order to liberate his people by taking them away from Pharaoh to save them. So if you want to see where the word Abid, Abid, is used in the Quran in the context of a slave. Go and check Quran chapter 2, verse 178. It is used in the notion of a slave, male slave. Quran chapter 2, verse 221. It is used as abid and in the context of a male slave. When we say amatu, it is a female bond maid, a female slave. That is a female bond maid, amatu. And it is used in Quran chapter 2 verse 221 or you can say bond mates right bond made right quran chapter 2 verse 221 a bond made that is a, that's why the word bond is in front of the maid we have something we call maid servant maid servant can be utilized in a different way from a bond maid a bond maid is a slave maid servant is different just like i told you the word slave and servant are not the same Right? Good. Now, when we say Ibadi, it can be translated as slaves and it can be translated as servants. But in the context of Quran chapter 24, verse 32, it means male slaves. Ibadi. Then we have bond maids, the plural form of the word Amatu. The word Amatu is a bond maid. So the plural form of the word Amatu, it becomes what? Amai. Amai. So this Amai can be also found in Quran chapter 24, verse 32. Now this in the subject, the context, and the content being addressed, this means slaves. These are slaves. 
You understand? This in this context, they are slaves. Now, in the notion of a servant, when we are dealing with servants, right? When you go to Quran chapter 51, verse 56 to verse 57, God says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create the genes and the humans except to serve me. You can say to worship me or you can say to serve me. It is both in line. Right? Some people will tell you, oh, we are not here to worship God. Worship can be translated as service at the same time. Right? Aha. Uh -huh. That is why you hear people saying you worship money. You are worshiping treasures. You are worshiping materials. You are worshiping what, whatever, whatever. You understand? It's like you are serving that thing to the extent you have made it as in the act of worship. Yes, we can we serve God and we worship God at the same time. But the, in, the, the real instance you have to understand the act of worship we do for God is the service. Right? Whatever you do for God, you get a reward. Whatever company you are working for, you work for your boss, you get a reward. So you become a servant in that instance because you are a worker. And I'm going to prove to you give, by giving you verses to prove to you you are a worker for God. So in that instance, you become a servant for God. And that's why we worship God because we love God. You understand? Uh -huh. Quran chapter 2 verse 165. You have to love God the most. But in the actual instance of working for somebody, I can work, be working for my boss, but I don't love my boss. Do you see the difference? Uh -huh. So I'm only serving my boss. I'm not worshiping my boss. But when it comes to God, you are loving God and serving God at the same time. So that is an act of worship. Right? So, for example, before I go to the example, chapter 51, verse 50, uh, uh, chapter 51, verse 56 to verse 57. He says, I did not create the genes and the humans except to serve me. That is to worship me. I do not want any sustenance from them. God never asks you to come and serve him in order to feed him. He doesn't want any sustenance from you. Nor do I want to be fed. Neither does he need you to go and work in order to bring him food. No. You see, the vice versa is, whatever people we are serving, huh, we are working for on this earth, if we don't work for them, they will not give them the more money to save, to pay us. You see? But you, in your case, if you don't serve God, God loses nothing. You serve God, he loses nothing. However, you will gain. But in this material world we live, if I don't work for my boss, he can lose and I can lose. Yes. Do you see how it works? So that is why with God, we classify it as worship and service at the same time. Whilst if you're doing the same act for a human being, we classify it as a service. That's why you become a servant, but you don't become a slave of your boss or a company. There's a difference. So now I take you to Quran chapter 5, verse 54, to, to let you understand why the service we do for God includes worship, because you have to love God. If you don't love God, you can't serve God and worship him. You see, so I take you to Quran chapter 5, verse 54, and let's see what it says. Uh, let me see if I can share a screen. Chapter 5, verse 54. Surah Al Ma'idah. Right? Uh -huh, I can share a screen, yes. Yeah. Now, this is Quran chapter 5, verse 54, Surah Al Ma'ida. Now, God is talking to the believers. He says, Ya you are Lazina Amanu. Man yartadda minkum andi nihi. That is, di nihi. Fasawfa yati lahu bikawmin yuhibbuhum. Wa yuhibbunahu. Azillatin. Al-Mu'minin, 
You see, you jahidu na fi sabili lahi wala yakhafuna laumatan laim laim. Zalika fadlu lahi yuti man yasha. Wallahu wasiun ali. Now this verse I just quoted is simply telling you the believers or you who have believed or all you who believe. Whoever among you should revert from his religion, that is deen. When we say religion here, it is believing in a supernatural being who controls your destiny. So you have the faith in him. You put your faith in this entity who controls your destiny, right? Now, to understand Fender, when you go to Quran chapter 98 verse 5, it says, so your deen, your faith has to be dedicated to this entity, sincerely, truthfully, to him alone. That is the act of worship. So it is going to define in this verse, chapter 5, verse 54, so that you see the act of worship. He says, who, who, all you who believe, whoever among you should revert from his religion after becoming a faithful person, believer, a Muslim, you submitted to God. Then you decided, no, now I'm not going to be a Muslim again. This is what God is telling you. Then God will bring forth a people whom he will love and they will love him. Do you see the act of worship here? If you are on here and you think, oh, I'm not going to serve God. I'm not going to love God. I will not serve him. I will not have faith in him and I will not serve him and I will not love him. God says he will bring a people whom he will love, and they will love him. And not only that, they will humble to the believers, mighty against the disbelievers, they will strive in the way of God, and will not fear the blame of a critic. That is the favor of God. He gives it to whomever he wills, for God is encompassing and omniscient. Now this defines an act of worship. What is worship? Why do we say worship? A feeling of profound love and admiration can be termed as worship. To love, to show devotion to a deity is an act of worship. So Quran chapter 98 verse 5 says, They were not commanded except what? To serve God, to worship God. Sincerely devoting the faith, the deen to him, truthfully. Octodosly, that becomes an act of worship. That is what is meant up definition of worship. So for people who say there is no act of worship in Islam, they should go back and study properly. Study the verses properly to see how you connect the act of worship with God. We are not only here to serve God, we are here to worship God. So this act of serving God is included with the word worship because you have to love God. That is why he sent the messenger, Quran chapter 3, verse 31. He says, Kul, in kuntum Allah If you should love God, then follow me. That is as the messenger. You follow him, the messenger, because he has the message of God whom you love to give you. That is why Quran chapter 2, verse 165 tells you, you have to love God more than any other thing. Yes. So bear that in mind. Now, Let's move on. So now we can see how we become the servants of God. We are actually serving God. So if you want to see the notion of the servant of God, even though I told you the word Abdu, Abdi, Abda, can also mean slave, but in the context which is used for the believers, it is a servant. Unless if somebody is taking you against your own will and not giving you free will and free choice, you become a slave to the person's ideology. Do you see? Now, when we say servant of God, if you go to Quran chapter 19, verse 30, where Isa alayhi salam, he says, Kala inni Abdullah. Jesus, he said, I am, I am a servant of God. He didn't mean I am a slave of God. Because when you read the context of the verses from verse 30, chapter 19, verse 30, you read downwards, you see how he is a servant of God. Then he says, he has given me the book and made me a prophet. You see, he has given him the book 
and made him a prophet. Similarly, when you work in a company, the boss can decide to make you the supervisor, to make you the organizer, to make you the chairman, to make you the managing director. You are not a slave. You are given positions and what to do. You understand? Uh -huh. So that gives you a, a rule, a choice, a, a will to make. Then again, if you want to see the plural form of the word Abdu or Abda or Abdi, you go to Quran chapter 37 verse 160, where God makes an exception for the servants of God. He says, accept the sincere servants of God, which the devil cannot mislead. That is Ibadillahi. So Ibadillahi, it is the plural form of the word Abdullah. Servant of God, it becomes servants of God, not slaves of God. No. Then when we say servant, most of times in the Quran, God addresses us as servants. Right? Quran chapter 15, verse 49. He says, inform my servants that I am the forgiving, the compassionate. He said that. He said, the messenger should tell us, inform my servant, his servant, that I am the forgiving, the merciful, or the compassionate. You see, so the servants of God, you are not the slaves, and I'm going to break that down, right? We are the servants of God, we are not the slaves of God. Put that at the back of your head. So Quran chapter 16 verse 97 is going to break that down. One, when you are a servant of God, you become a worker for God. Understand this. If you are a servant of God, you become a worker for God. You see how it works? Good. So I'm taking you to Quran chapter 16, verse 97. Quran chapter 16. Then I take you to verse 97. Yeah, I put it here. So I share the screen and let's see what the verse says. Yeah. So Surah to Nahal, chapter of the B, verse 97. God says, Man amila su'alihan. Men zakari wa au untha. Whoever works a righteous deed, or whoever what acts righteous, or whoever does a good deed, right? As a male or a female. When we say zakari in Arabic, it means a male. When we say untha, it is a female. Then God says, whoever works righteous, right? Whoever works righteous, whether a male or a female, as a male or a female, while he or she is a believer, then now God says he will what? He will now, uh, while he is a believer, then we will cause him to live a good life. You see, whoever acts righteous as a male and a female while being a believer, then we, God, will cause him or her, that person, to live a good life. And we will repay them their reward by the best of what they used to do. So whoever acts righteous, this is what God wants from you. Now, this is a, from this statement, it's a free will. Whoever acts righteous, meaning some people will not want to act righteous. So whether being a male and a female, while being a believer, which God wants you to be, then he will cause him to live a good life. He will cause you to live a good life. And we will repay them their reward by the best of what they used to do. You see, by the best of what you used to do. So this becomes a servant, not a slave. You are being told what to do with a free will. Decide if you want to act righteous. 
and you'll be given the best reward according to what you used to do. If I used to, if I'm better than you, don't expect us to get the same reward. Do you see how it works? But whether you are a male and a female, and you, a female, can do better than a male, you get your reward at the best of what you can do. Same goes with a male. If he can do better than you, fine. He get the best of what he can do. Do you see how simple it is? Then again, Quran chapter 3, verse 195. Right? In Quran chapter 3, verse 95, 195, God says that I will not waste the deed of a male or a female worker. That is, he will not waste the deed uh, of any, any male or female worker. So if you want to understand, in that Arabic word, in that Arabic sentence, it says, Amilin. When we say Amilin, it means a worker. So God says, I will not waste the deed, any act or deed you did, any deed of any male or female worker among you, you are of each other. So if you are a believer, male or female, God will never waste your deed. But you are a worker, remember that. So whilst being a servant, you are a worker. You are not a slave. You are a servant as a worker for God. So you'll be paid by it for, for a reward. Yes. Uh huh. I guess I guess people are, are, are following what I'm I'm giving here from the Quran, right? Uh huh. So as a male and a female, you'll be rewarded by the best of what you used to do or you can do. You'll be paid, whether male or female. You are a worker for God. That's why you are a servant of God. But it includes the an act of worship because you need to love that entity in order to work for that entity. This is not like the worldly affairs we have whilst you're working for a boss, but you don't like your boss or you don't love your boss. That's different because no company will you go when you are going to sign a contract and the boss will say, you have to love me before you serve me. No, it's not there like that. Right? So this is why with God, we classify it as an act of worship. And that becomes a religious act. Yes. So Islam is a religion. It's a faith. Uh, believing in a supernatural being who controls your destiny. You see? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Salam. Alaja Atal Mahmo. Salam. Abu Tamas. You are welcome. <laughs> Book of Uda. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, now, we have seen Quran chapter 16, verse 97. Whether male or female, you'll be paid. You have a good life if you are a believer, and then you'll be paid for the best of what you have done, right? And then God will not waste your deed, any male or female worker. So far as you are a believer and you are working for your good deeds, God will not waste your deed. He has assured you that. Now, Quran chapter 39, verse 60 to 61. This is what people I want people to understand. People will keep lying to you. You only, only enter the kingdom of God by, by his mercy or because he has sympathy for you. No, he asks you to do a work. Just like a company, a boss will pay you for your, your salary if you are only done the right thing he asks you to do. God will also give you your reward by the best of what you have done. He's not going to put you to, uh, uh, to paradise because, oh, you are handsome. Or because oh your family is Prophet Muhammad's family, or it becomes you before because you are you are Prophet Noah's younger brother. No, Prophet Noah who even couldn't even save his son, his own son. Quran chapter eleven verse forty downwards. He couldn't save his own son, so he should come and save you. Prophet Muhammad Quran chapter six verse fifty one to fifty two. He will not be answerable for whatever you have done, and you, you will not be answerable for whatever he has done. He cannot save you on the day of judgment. Do you know what will save you? I'm going to tell you. Quran chapter 39, verse 60 to 61. And on the day of resurrection, you will see those who lied about God with their faces darkened, blackened. Is there no abode in hell for the arrogant ones? Verse 61. And God will rescue those who were pious by their what achievement. Mafazatihim, 
By your achievement is what God is going to save you on the day of judgment. No evil will touch them, nor will they grieve. That is what how you'll be saved on the day of judgment. It's not by the will of somebody else. It's not because somebody else was prominent. It's not because of by the mercy of whatever you whatever idols you have set aside. It's by your achievement. You see, so that is why in Quran chapter 3, verse 195, that God says he will not waste the deed of any male or female worker among you. You are of each other because you are believers. So it is based on what you have done. Your achievement is what God is going to save you with. Nothing else. So put that in your head. Good. <clears throat> now, the question. God has given us a free will to make decisions. A, a, a slave doesn't have a choice. A servant has a choice. A slave doesn't have a free will. A servant has a free will. A slave doesn't earn a salary. A servant earns a salary. Agreed upon. A servant has a choice to love the one he's serving. A slave has no choice. He has to submit by force. No choice. So understand this. We are not the slaves of God. But yes, we are the servants of God. Because we work for God. Question. Chapter 76, verse 2 to verse 3. God says, indeed, we created a human being from sperm, germ cells, to test him. So we granted him hearing and eyesight. Indeed, we led him to the way. That is Sabila, the way. Either he is grateful or either he is ungrateful. So you have a choice. God has given you the free will. It's either you decide to become a grateful servant of God or ungrateful. But however, if you decide to become a grateful servant, this is what God is saying. Quran chapter 4 verse 147. مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهِ بِأَزَابِكُمْ إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ Hmm? وَكَيْنَ اللَّهُ uh, شَاكِرًا alima. God says, what would God do? What would God do with punishing you if you are grateful and believed? What, what will he gain from punishing you? Now, what will God gain when he punishes you if you believed and uh, you are a grateful servant? Why will he punish you? God is never an ungrateful be, uh, uh, entity. And God is grateful and omniscient because he's all knowing of what you believe and what you, you are grateful for. So why will he punish you? So that's why you are a servant of God. You are not a slave of God. A slave master can decide to punish you for no goddamn reason. What can you do? Nothing. That is what a slave master will do. That is what Pharaoh did to the children of Israel by killing the men and leaving the women. You see? So we should understand this notion of slavery. That in no instance, you see even some ignorant people saying, Ashadu Allah ila illallah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abdu wa rasulu. Then they say Muhammad is a slave of God. Are you a fool? Do you understand the word slave? Even we among the people, God doesn't condone us to enslave each other. But that doesn't mean people are not enslaving each other. Just like we saw Pharaoh enslaving the children of Israel. It's not as if God is the one condoning that to happen. But it will happen whether you like it or not. Yes. People will enslave each other whether you like it or not. So that is why God... What incites us to sl free slaves. If you ever you see people trying to enslave people, you free slaves. You free them. Huh? Fuck Rakaba. You, you don't abandon a, a slave. You free them. Because they are they have been what possessed, owned. So you try to free them. Away. When you go to Quran chapter 43, verse 32. God is asking a question. 
He says, are they the distributors of the mercy of your Lord? We have provided their livelihood among them in the worldly life and raised some of them above others in degrees so that they may take each other in labor. Now, this word used uh, is sukhrian. Sukhrian is labor. To take somebody to work for you. What is the labor? A social class compromising and uh, comprising those who do manual labor or work for wages. So it is God who programmed like that so that we can take each other to work for us and pay each other so that life can move on without, without enslaving somebody. You understand? You, the person has to benefit from you. you. They work for you for the service. You pay them. But a slave doesn't get that. You know? Aha. Uh -huh. So then God says, but the mercy of your Lord is better than what they accumulate. What the people gather, the mercy of God far passes that. Now, chapter 16, verse 71. And God has favored some of you over others in sustenance. But those who have been favored will never repel their sustenance to those their right hands possess. Right? then they will become equal. Because if God has favored you with the sustenance and you decide to move that sustenance to somebody else whom you are superior than, what happens? You become equal. Will you do that? So God says, so is it the blessing of God they will reject? Who will do that? Nobody. You understand? Somebody who is in a subordinate position than you, you want to give them something to become equal to you. Will you do that? Then who is going to serve who? Do you get this comparison? The question God is asking. Aha. Uh -huh. So these are some of the things we don't pay attention to. The little details we leave aside is what is causing us to, to be misled. You see, a uh, book of Buddha is saying something. Book of Suda says, in, in Sunni religion, we are taught that our works mean nothing. And only by the mercy of God, we will be able to get to Jannah. You see, whilst the Quran is saying, contrary to what Sunnis are teaching people. So who should we believe? Is it God? Or is it the liars? Huh? God says in Quran chapter 23, verse 90, bil wa la We have brought them the truth, in fact, but they are what? The liars. Uh -huh. So let people keep lying to themselves. Hey, salam, Rashid. Yeah, salam for those who are joining. I'm almost about to end the topic. But, anyways, you can keep your questions and answers coming, uh, uh, questions coming so that I can give the answers before I drop the topic. Uh, today, let me see. That is the phone number, the WhatsApp number for anybody who wants to call and, con and make a contribution. You can call. And I'll be organizing some uh, some fundraising for usually, I do it almost every six months for the people. I, I feed old people back in Ghana. So I'll be organizing that maybe middle of this month going so that people can donate. Normally, I do it on GoFundMe page, right? So I'll be putting up the link, then you can support so that we can feed the necessary people. Usually, uh, we feed people, we put it on GoFundMe. So those who have donated, you get pictures of the distributions when we give out the food and donations, right? Uh -huh. So this is a legit thing I've been doing for over two years or three years. So it is nothing new, right? Yes. Uh, so anybody who has a question can call and ask a question. Uh, Amro B says, are you a Muslim? Yes, I'm a Muslim according to the Quran. Yes, I submit to God alone when it comes to the deen. I don't submit to any other entity in the Islam, only God. That is what makes me a Muslim. Yes, so I'm a Muslim. Amro B, uh, is good to Quran this way. somebody is asking, is it good to hold Quran and swear it? We don't see any of the examples in the Quran. No prophet has done it. No, 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 uh, you know, believer in the Quran has ever done, done it. You swear by God, right? That is who we swear by. We don't swear by any other thing, but by God, right? 
Mm -hmm. So I don't condone the act of swearing with the Quran because Quran is not your God. Quran is only the word of God, right? So you don't swear by anything but by God. So for instance, if you go to Quran chapter 6, verse 23, to swear by God, Wallahi, if you say Wallahi, uh, Rab, ha, Tallahi, that is by God. But I don't see the notion why you would swear by any other thing. Even the act of, in the, in the case of fornication, the adultery, God never said you should swear by any other thing. You have to swear by God. You see, uh -huh. so that is how to swear. You don't swear by Quran, by anything, no, no. There's no example of that sort in the Quran to swear by a book or anything. You see? Uh -huh. Amro B, the lecture I did today is about the servants of God. We are not the slaves of God. So later on, you can watch the full program. You can understand what I said, I spoke about, right? Amro B. Uh -huh. He says, do you follow Muhammad? God didn't say I should follow Muhammad. Muhammad is dead. How can I follow him? So you have to be specific with your statement. I'm not following Muhammad. He's dead. How can I follow Muhammad? Amrobi, my number is there. Can you call? Call and ask your question. Call. Please, don't keep typing, typing. A book of Uda says, Bye bye, I watch your Salat's guide. I need to go through it properly. But my question is, how did you get the order of mo the movement that you show? Did you order by logic or does the Quran show it? When you take the Quran, it gives you instructions in, in precepts. In precepts. So when a command starts in the Quran, for instance, if you go to Quran chapter 2, verse 238, it says, Hafizu wa salatul wusta. Then it says, wa kumu lillahi qanitin. So it tells you here salat has to do with the act of kumu lillahi. You stand for God qanitin obediently. Standing posture is included. Then we have the notion of what? Sujood included in the Salat. If you take Quran chapter 19, verse 58 to 59, you see the prophets of God, they did sujood, kharru, sujada. They fall down in sujood. You understand? So sujood is included. Then again, when you take Quran chapter 22, verse 77, it says, Ya yuwa amanu, arka'un wajjudu wa abdu rabbakum. So arka'un wajjudu is part of the act we do to God, right? Uh -huh. So, in actual instance, from standing, before you go to sujood, there is rukun in between because you have to bow down in order to prostrate. You see, uh -huh. so it is by the verses stated in the Quran what is guarded to be submitted. I didn't use any external source from any, any other source. I use whatever you find in the Quran, attach it together and use it. Right, and the examples of whatever has been done can be found in the Quran as we see the prophets and the messengers have done in the Quran. So, I gave you the summary Quran chapter 19, verse 58 to 59 is there. And remember, Salat the concept of this Salat didn't start from us, even if you go to the Bible, uh, the Old Testament, go to Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, uh, chapter 8, verse, verse 4 to verse 6. Right, uh -huh. I think Nehemiah 8 verse 4 to verse 6 7 8 you read from there you see the the this thing the the notion of the criteria itself <clears throat> i'm robi go and watch my video for that i'm i'm not here for that i spoke about slaves and servants of god let's take let's stick to the point and ask relevant questions to that don't ask me questions uh, I've already had the video already. But that's why my YouTube channel is there. My lectures are there. The videos are there. Find time to watch. I don't keep repeating myself. It's of no use. Uh, Habib Kamara says, please, is there five, five time prayers in a day? Uh, 
<clears throat> the Quran doesn't say five time prayers in a day. No, it doesn't exist anywhere there. Yeah, no, no, nothing like five times a day prayers. It doesn't say like that. Uh, don't love Suru Salam. How are you, bro? Uh, my sister Rashida Mohammed Salam, you're welcome. <clears throat> uh, yes, let the questions come in. Amro B, I think you are blind. Can't you see the number scrolling down the page? The WhatsApp number is there on the page. You can see it clearly. You keep typing gibberish. I said call. Call. Let's let's have a uh, cheat for that here. Call and ask the question and be re re ready to answer my questions. Call, please. It's a WhatsApp call. It's a free call. Just call and, and be courage enough to introduce yourself. He says I'm in another country, man. <laughs> uh, Amro B, or oh, is it Amrob, or what are you trying to call your name? Please call, call, don't type. Call me right now. WhatsApp call, just call, and let's talk. If you are in another country, so that means you cannot call. So no wonder you type by saying you are a slave of God. Uh, Shaz, Shaz Ma says, was Musa alayhi salam companion, his servant or slave? What was the correct word used when he ordered him to be in him the fish? The word used is uh, the fatahu. When we say fatahu, it means young man. You understand? Fatahu. Oh, that is fatah. That is young man. Right? Uh -huh. It has nothing to do with uh, a slave. It doesn't say Moses had a slave. It wasn't his slave. So please understand that. That is in Quran chapter 18, verse 62 and verse 60. Right? Uh -huh. It's fatahu. Fatahu means his young man, not, not, not his slave. Moses never had a slave, right? Aha, uh -huh. so please pay attention to that. Yeah, salam, Sister Natalia, you're welcome. Uh, Somed Rashid said, do you believe Adam is the first created? No, I don't believe that. Look at your question. You said, do I believe Adam is the first created, meaning first creation? <laughs> no, he's not. Then what say about the evolution of humankind or Adam came through alone the evolution, and but not first human created? Uh, Samad Rashid, your question is not that clear. I, I don't know if it has to do with the English. But the point is, uh, in the Quran, when you read chapter 15, verse 26, 27, 28, it tells you there's a creation of, creation of Bashar, and there's creation of Insan, and there's the creation of the Jan, that is the Jinn. So if you understand how the notion of Homo sapiens and hominidae, which people can classify as uh, uh, Homo uh, erectus, if you understand this notion, we have the, what we call homo sapiens, and then we have the hominidae. They are different types. They are human beings, but they are different types. So I can classify Adam as a human being, but mainly homo, uh, hominidae, right? Then we have the homo sapiens. So this is a broad topic. I think I've, uh, I need to find a time to speak about this because it can be complicated at the same time. So Adam wasn't the first creation. So if you put it right for you, we don't say Adam is the first creation. No, he's not. Yeah. For Fana, uh, mom says, bro, it is it is mistake to refer to the Bible to back up your claim of Salat. If Salat is a form of ritual, do you think all Salat in Quran is ritual? 
uh, your question is not making sense somehow. First of all, you draw conclusion by saying, bro, it is it is mistake to refer to the Bible to back up your claim of Salat. I didn't refer to the Bible to back up my claim. The Quran is a confirmation of what was before it, right? Quran, chapter 10, verse 37, the Quran confirms what was before it. The same Quran told us, Quran chapter 6, verse 91, these people... They, reveal, they manifest some of what God has revealed and then they conceal most of it, right? So what they reveal, we can confirm. We can see it in their books. So just because I go to their book to confirm what is similarly in the Quran doesn't mean I'm going to them to back up my claim. Quran is rather confirming what you find there, right? In the second place also, if you say, do you think all Salat in Quran is ritual? Your question is totally wrong. Because the word Salat comes with the marifa. It is as Salat. So when he says as Salat, as a noun, God always means the same thing. But when it is used as a verb, the Salli or Salah as an ad adjective or verb, then they can have different meanings. You understand? So when you are specific, be specific with your question. Don't use the word all salat in Quran is a ritual. Salat on its own, right, is a ritual. Yes, but I don't term it as a prayer, ritual prayer, no. But it's a ritual because you have to follow certain norms about it. Yes. Uh, let me see some of the questions I've skipped. Uh, Amrobi, keep giving your excuses, right? My number is still available, so try, try, try again at the right time. Uh, Fatima Chin, no problem. We see you again, inshallah. Habib Kamara says, thanks for the answer, but if Quran did not mention the five-time prayer, how many times can one pray, perform a prayer in a day? Like I said, I don't limit, I don't mean limit the word salat to a prayer, right? However, there is prayer in salat. If you go to Quran chapter 3, right, chapter 3 of the Quran, and you read verse 37, 38, 39. It tells you Zachariah did salah. In his salah, he was invoking God. He used it for prayer, right? But I don't limit the word salah to prayer alone. No. Salat is a broad thing. It's a broad topic. It's a broad thing which includes prayer. So prayer, yes, you can include, but it doesn't. you don't limit it to prayer. So God doesn't say pray. When we say pray, I can be sitting here and pray. You understand? But I will categorize this as a supplication. You understand? Because prayer is a communi act of communicating with a deity. Quran chapter 6, verse 162. The prophet himself, Kul, he says, Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahayaya wa mamatilillahi rabbil alim. He says, my salat is for God. So your salat is dedicated for God. And Quran chapter 20, verse 14. God says, So Salat, you establish Salat for God's remembrance. So it tells you Salat is dedicated for God and you establish Salat for the remembrance of God. So the act of remembrance of God is also included in a Salat. That is the main reason why you establish Salat, for the remembrance of God. So in the remembrance of God, you can do the act of prayer, you can do the act of thanksgiving, you can do the act of bowing down, prostration. It's, it encompasses a lot of things together. You understand? Uh -huh. So I don't limit the word salat only to prayer. Yes, but it is included. You see? Uh -huh. So God never said five times prayer. The timings for the salat given to the prophet, you can find it in Quran chapter 11, verse 114, and Quran chapter 17, verse 78 to 79. Those are the timings he has been given. So it is three times a day, which is confirmed by Quran chapter 76, verse 25 to verse 26. The three times for the, for the zikr. 
that you can do in the night uh, in the morning evening and the night yeah understand and they get on my nerves acting so naive like this <laughs> Uh, Khalifa Abdul Malik says the question is is one or another asking question with the intention to get the correct answer or to try and find a contradiction or to find out the correct answer I wonder you know when when a sectarian especially the Sunnis the Shia uh, the Ahmadiyas or the, the sectarians in Islam the, the so-called sectarians when they are asking questions, they are not asking questions to be enlightened because they have a preconceived notion in their head. They have been enslaved, mentally enslaved by their scholars, right? To have a perception about things. So when they are asking a question, they are not asking to be enlightened, neither do they need room to be improved. They are asking you questions to look down on you, to tell you, ah, are you trying to say you know better than our scholars? So look at what Amrubi wrote, first of all. He says, I want to know your new version of Islam. If this person was educated enough from the Quran, he wouldn't write such a stupid statement. You understand? Whatever I'm teaching is from the Quran. I didn't bring a new doctrine to tell you this is a new book and this is what I'm going to teach you. <laughs> and you are calling the teachings of the Quran as a new version of Islam. It tells you how uneducated these people are. You understand? Nazir Enesi says, can a wife do something without her husband's permission according to the Quran? Yes, she can do. So if you, if you, Nazir Enesi, look at the scope of your question. Can a wife do something, something yes, she can do? Yeah. Habib Kamara say, is there anything like the five pillars of Islam? There is no such thing as five pillars of Islam in the Quran. It is the sectarians who put it down as the pillars of Islam. God never said these are five pillars of Islam. No. And even that shahada is a mushrik shahada because they say, Ashadu, I bear witness that there is no God by God. Then they say what? And I bear witness that Muhammad is the man. You are a hypocrite if you do that. Quran chapter 63 verse 1, even the people who saw Muhammad at his time, and he said, they said, we bear witness that God says they are liars, they are hypocrites. You understand? So to say that you are a hypocrite, you can say, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, yet, yeah, but not a shadow. Yeah, walaikum salam, uh, Yusuf, how are you? Yeah. How's, how's everything? Alhamdulillah, long time. Yes, I just want to ask a question because I have detailed my question. I see that you are in UNC. I want to ask you, is there a difference between Alhamdu wa Shuku? Alhamdu and what? And Shuku. And shuku. Yeah, Shukur is like a thanks. Uh, Hamdu is praise. There is a difference. They are not the same thing. However, you have to be satisfied with somebody in order to praise the person. But not always. Sometimes I can praise somebody without actually getting any benefit from them. You understand? Like when we watch football, when you are praising a footballer, you are praising that footballer, that doesn't mean you are thanking the footballer. You understand? So if you say you thank God, shukr alillah, that is thanking God. But when you say Alhamdulillah, you are only praising God. There's no thanks there. So there's a difference. They are not the same. Okay. Yeah. Because I thought that uh, Shukun, it's required uh, works, work. That's what? why Allah say, input, uh, input uh, in, so you know that in some fast, Allah say that, in Shakaritum, as it are not well, la in shakartum, la azida nakum. Yes, Quran chapter 14, verse 7. If you are grateful, I will increase for you. Yes, okay. So, um, what was, does it uh, did it, uh, does it uh, require work? Oh, being, being grateful, let me tell you how it works. When you are grateful, for instance, when God gave Moses the book, 
the tablets. That Quran chapter 7, verse 145, 146, 147. He says, uh, he says, Who's ma atay to care? Wakun mina shakirin. Take what I have given you and be of those who are grateful. Now, when you are grateful, it means something has been done to you or for you. So you show your appreciation. So when you say thank you to God, it means he has done some favor for you that you appreciate. So now, now he can increase whatever he has given you. So let's say if I ask God to give me 10 euro and he gave me 10 euro and I say thank you God for giving me 10 euro. Tomorrow he might be willing to give me 20 euro. This is how it works. Okay. So it, does, it doesn't require any work maybe to give the, uh, the uh, 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 in terms of maybe in the money, maybe to give a portion of the money to something or to work. Uh, that is that is not necessarily the point for that. The point for that is a duty. Giving charity and other stuff is a duty that God has put on a believer, right? So far as you are a worker for God, you have to do such duty. It's just like a, being employed in a company, right? For, for instance, God says, What is a lukuruba hakka who wal miskina wabana sabil wala tu bazir tabzira. So now, if I have sufficient money, I have to give my relative their due, which is a command. So now, if I give my relative their due, it means I'm following the commands of God. Okay. But being grateful is that whenever God has given me something, I need to show appreciation. The appreciation doesn't mean necessarily mean I'm taking out of it to give somebody a percentage. That means appreciation. No. You understand? Okay. Uh -huh. So my second my second question is that uh, those scholars require uh, acquire, require posture and uh, maybe sujud and rukub. Uh, salat salat in the Quran has been described, not prescribed. If it is prescribed, that means it is a must. Everybody must do it that way. Right. You understand? If you go to the, the, the pharmacy or you go to a doctor and he prescribes something for you, that prescription must be adhered to in order to follow. But when something is described, it doesn't become an, a, a, you know, an entangled to your neck to necessarily do it that way. For instance, if you take Quran chapter 2 verse 239, according to God, you can do salat whilst you are walking or you are riding. Do you understand? You can do salat whilst you are walking or you are riding. So if I'm walking or riding, how can I stand and prostrate and then, you know, do ruku? I can't do all that. Can I do that? Uh -huh. So in the Quran, it doesn't become really 100% mandatory where God says, hey, if you are going to do salat, you have to necessarily put your head to the dark ground. He doesn't say that. However, we are checking the examples that the prophets have done in the Quran, the messengers. That is what we are checking to follow, the footsteps. So Quran chapter 4, verse 26, God says he intends to guide you by the examples of those before you. Inshallah. Yes, you understand? So specifically, if it is about ablution, the wudu, God specifically described, uh, prescribed it for you. Quran chapter 5, verse 6, right? Nobody can argue that. Yes. But yes. when it comes to the Salat, there is no prescription. There is actually a description, not a prescription, a description. But when it comes to the Wudu, there is a what? Prescription that you have to follow. So it's not binding. If you want to do your Salat and you decide that, okay, I'm going to only read the book. I'm not going to prostrate. There is no way God says, hey, Yusuf, when you are going to perform the Salat after washing, read the Quran, put your head to the ground. Did he command you like that? No, 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 no. Good. So what we find in the Quran concerning the Salat of the messengers, we see description, not prescription. But what we see about wudu is a prescription, not a description. So prescription meaning you have to follow it because that is what has been prescribed for you. Yes. You understand? The notion of Salat, you can't force somebody to follow the Salat you understand is Salat. The videos I did about Salat, till date, I'm yet to see any scholar who can come out for that dialogue or debate. 
I'm not, whatever I did there, I'm not forcing it on and say, hey, you must do it like that or you're not going to heaven. I never, I never said that to people. But however, whatever I did in the video, I took the example from the Quran and I put it there. So whatever I did was okay. from the Quran. It wasn't outside the Quran. Do you get my point? Yes. Uh -huh. So let, let's give yes. another caller the chance. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mariam Jafaru says, please, I just want one thing from you. I can't go back and watch your old review. How many salats you pray a day? Can you take a few minutes to summarize it for me? You say, how many salat do you pray a day? Maximum is three. Can you take a few minutes to summarize it for me? We have Salat al-Fajr, Salat al-Isha, and Salat al-Wusta. Uh, these three. I have a video on it. I can send you the link. You can get it, inshallah. Yes, hello? Adam. Adam from UK. Uh, Adam from UK. Nice to meet you, Adam. Yes. How may I help you? Uh uh, nice to meet you. Is it, is it Shai? Yes, you are calling Shai. Yes. Oh, uh, okay. Um, my my question. Um, to be honest with you, you know, I am a I'm a Muslim born and I'm adult. And and very recently, I come across um, I come across your video, and I really do understand. And. I know it is a crisis to a lot of Muslim, whether Sunni or Shu. I mean, Sunni or Shia. Yeah. It's a crisis for people. Yeah. Um, and uh, my 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 question to you is, I'm I'm really learning, and I'm glad I come across your videos. Right. Thank Only you. very recent. Thank you. Only very recently, um, with the, some other scholars with some other scholars like, uh, I don't know, Dr. Hani, um, there's another South African guy. So my question to you, number one is, I saw your Salat, um, your Salat, um, what was it? Was it descriptions? Um, or, or no, the, it was step-by-step. Step yeah, that, that, the, the, the my, tutorial, yeah. To, yeah, Salat tutorial. What I would say to you, Shai, what I request from you, it is extremely, to my, to my understanding, it is extremely, extremely important uh, issue. But I would, I, would, I would like, if you could do in a, you know, it was a really a small video and it was uh, really, but if you could do, you know, the ayat, you take the samples for ayat, you, you say the numbers, um uh, and sometimes very quickly but it was it was an extremely important tutorial so if you could do um another tutorial which is much more for example um i don't know how to say much more clear like getting the ayah reading it uh, explaining it a bit more that would i would appreciate that that's 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 just a suggestion my question is you know these rakat where does rakat come from four rakat three rakat it's not from God. It's from, from the Hadith books. It is purely from the Hadith books. Yeah. Fabricated. Yes, they are fabrications. Subhanallah. Yeah. So that means Nabi Muhammad, alayhi salam, he never prayed the way we pray. No, it's not. Because let me tell you the reason why. In their own Hadith books, Number one, they say the prophet says, he says, Sallu kamara aitumuni usalli. He says you should pray as you have seen me pray. Now, yes, number I one, remember. number one, it will be a contradiction for us to say we have seen him pray. Now, in their own yes. hadith books, they said, Khulhu Quran. They say Nanaisha said the prophet's character, everything was only the Quran. So if the prophet only followed the Quran, and that is the same Quran we are reading today. What gives us the impression of the, the notion of raka'at, the notion of things that they are doing which are not found in the al furqan Because the Quran is the al furqan Yes. So if we check in the Quran, we didn't see all these things. Which means the Prophet is following another source of guidance other than the Quran. 
It has to be, yes. You see, and that, that will be a contradiction. Because God didn't say he gave him two guidance. He gave him one guidance. And as said in Quran chapter 61 verse 9, He sent him with the guidance, one guidance, not two. And yes. The, the guidance is clear in the, in the Quran chapter 2 verse 159. God says, uh, uh, ma min al ma fil kitab. God has already made it clear in the Al-Kitab. We have it here, the guidance. So if that is the yes. guidance, and we have it, and we don't see the notion of raka'at, we don't need to see the notion of five salat in a day, we don't see this notion of salat al-Eid, salat al-Eid uh, al fitr Eid al-what. Where, where are they coming from? Um, absolutely, but, they, but you understand, Shai, yeah? Mm -hmm. it's, it's over 1,400 years, so 1,300 years, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, um, he, 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 the Muslims, you know, I'm from Somalia, right? Mm -hmm. Sunni Muslim, whatever, like, whatever they call. But this is this is uh, this this is the thing. Um, it's really, you know, everything everything you know about the religion, it has to be re-examined. Yes, everything everything you know about you thought you not know. Everything we thought we know about the religion has to be re. -examined. Yes, it has. To. It has to. It, it has to from the roots of even the classical Arabic language. Look, I have a, a big question mark with the Arabic, you know, uh, structure itself. You know, because me being somebody who has translated the Quran uh, within six years, and I know what I'm talking about. Because I, I do have talks with scholars, with students, and with the lecturers. I do know the perception on how they think. Because you can be enslaved by a language as well. You understand? And yes. it seems this is the hurdle people are trying to climb when it comes to the Quran. You, you, you get it? Uh -huh. So when, whenever people think, okay, I need to go to Saudi Arabia to study Arabic before approaching the Quran, this is where the wrong perception comes in. Because remember, Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad yes. according to the people, According to the uh, the sectarians, they claim he was unlettered. They would claim he was illiterate. Illiterate, yes. That is I what that is. So. Yes, I don't believe so as well. That's what they claim. So how can an illiterate be the teacher of the Arabs? Who few claim they are eloquent in Arabic language and poems and whatever? Why would that illiterate now become the teacher? According to chapter sixty-two, oh, verse two, God sent him as a teacher to teach them the book and the wisdom. Yes. Yes, not only not only the book, but the wisdom. Exactly. So now, remember, in that chapter 62, verse 2, God called them Umiyuna. Those yes. people. So if these sectarians will claim that the word Umi means illiterate or unlettered, so how come this illiterate is going to teach another illiterate people and they can write and read, and yet the teacher cannot read and write? Does it make sense? Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. To be honest with you, when it's when after what we did, what we did um, so many times, you know, I, you know, normal. I went to Madrasa like anyone else, yeah. and the teacher, and the teacher, my teacher, for example, my time, um, he 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 knew the Quran. He could read the Quran, but he when he could he couldn't explain the Quran. He couldn't try. So this is how we. This is how we learn the Quran. Right? We read the Quran, but we don't know the meaning. Yeah. My, you know, a lot of, lot of Muslims, I'm talking about a lot of, I'm talking about, you know, everybody, but a lot of Muslims, particularly in, in Africa, particularly in Africa, you know, we read the Quran, but we, we don't know the meaning. And, and we live in a, we, we believe, we believe in an assumption, assumption religion. That's what we have. Yes. Yes. It's a, it's a pre, preconceived assumption that we already, we have already been taught. We assume things. And that is why Quran, Quran chapter 6, verse 116 says, if you obey most of those on earth, they will mislead you from the way of God. Because everybody assumes. It's just an assumption. I've, I've met somebody who claims to be a lecturer of this Arabic language, and he keeps fumbling. You know, he keeps fumbling when it comes to the Quran. And I kept laughing. I was like, what? So you are a teacher of Arabic language, and you're fumbling? You understand? If God says, Atiullah, 
obey God and obey the messenger. You hear them saying, follow God and follow the messenger. The word atiu doesn't mean follow. It means obey. But you hear so-called lecturers of Arabic language saying, follow. This is the confusion, isn't it? This is this is the confusion. When you when you non Arab non Arab speaker, non Arabic speaker, you always I think this is the wrong assumption. We 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 think you know the well. I I thought Arabs know uh, know the Quran, especially you know breaches. They don't. I, they don't know. Uh, they, well, you when when you when you when you listen to uh, someone like you, someone like Dr. Hani, someone like um, a lot of others, yeah, and 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 not only taking one surah, but for example, Salah, yeah, ninety nine times appears ninety nine times in the Quran. Yeah. for example, I think it was you or someone else. So you, it gives you a comprehensive understanding about the Salah. Where yeah. someone says, okay. Follow the you know um, This is this is one thing they come on. Yes. The other thing is uh, the other thing is the ayah which says uh, Rasulullah is 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 what Hasana is is you know. Ah, uh, laka fi Rasulullahi uswatu Hasana. Yeah. Uswatu mm. Hasana. And and this is what they say. This is you know is the is the is the is the Rasul of Allah. Whatever whatever he does. Means is it, it become it become like the Quran? It, it become like the Mushaf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's how, that's how yeah happened. that's how they put it, and that's why they created other books for people to follow, and that is where the problem arises. Because whenever a doctrine has been made which is taking you away from the Quran, it becomes a problem. You know, books are meant to be taking us back to the Quran, not away from the Quran. So if you have books of scholars today taking you away from the Quran, that's a problem. And that's why the Hadith is troublesome in Islam today. 99% of the books are like that. Yes. I don't know, so far what I've seen, 99%. They are. They are they actually. Across. They are. And that, so that, that is the biggest problem Muslims have to face in this, in this era. And we are, we are thankful to God we are in the age of technology. You information can reach you with the blink of an eye. You just need to research. That is all. You research things. That's true. So if somebody's lying with the blink of an eye, you just see it. You just check and find the facts. Simple. Subhanallah. You know. Subhanallah. Anyways, Subhanallah. I would I would appreciate I would appreciate if you can do a lectures uh, where the misconception came from and how they uh, infiltrate into the you know, the religion, you know, the, the word of Allah. That yeah. Would been, that would be appreciated, Shaiba. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll put that in my plans, inshallah. We, we do that, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, Salam. Yeah, Salam. Thank you. Salam. Salam alaikum. Your name and where you're calling from? All right. Yes, brother. So I have, yeah, Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I'm calling from Malaysia. Aha, uh -huh, okay, for fun, yeah. Right? Last time I was up you and he sent me all the, the, the documents. How you doing? Alhamdulillah, brother, for fun. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, brother, first of all, I'd like to thank you for all your effort you're doing to, you know, clarify the Quran to the people. Mm, I really thank appreciate you. it. Yeah. So I have just two questions and one comment. Yeah. <laughs> Regarding the salad, uh, personally, okay, I don't believe that salad is a ritual mm -hmm. because one, uh, if anyone read the Quran, it's not easy for you. Why God will make it so complicated to, you know, understand the ritual form of salad in the Quran? Because you cannot read the Quran and then perform ritual straight away without hadith. I know you have done, I have seen your videos, everything. You understand? Because you have very deep understanding of the Quran. Okay. So my question is this. Returning the Quran, uh, why we need to recite the Quran to God or during this? Uh, coming back to your question, first of all, when we say salat is ritual, it's different from saying the ritual forms of salat. 
There is no okay. such thing as ritual forms or postures of Salat. However, okay. the reason why okay, okay. Salat is a ritual, it didn't start from you. Salat started from Abraham. It went to all the prophets, Moses, Jesus. It is going by generations. And it is, it is part of the covenant God has taken with Abraham. That is why we have to follow the creed of Abraham. Now, what is a ritual? A ritual is a customary observance or practice, or it can be the prescribed procedure for conducting a religious sense or ceremony. Yeah, to so, apply, you know, based uh, on certain dates. Uh, uh, I mean, yes, yes, it's a religion. So religious, okay. that, you know, it's a faith. We have faith in okay. God. We don't see God, right? We don't see the angels, okay. but we have faith. Mm -hmm. So now this mm -hmm. faith, you have been instructed with the salat that you should establish the salat, and it didn't start from you. So it is a generational thing keeps coming down, passing down to you. So that alone, that mm -hmm. alone becomes a ritual by definition. Do you see where, where okay, the notion sure. of ritual comes okay. in? Okay. So in that sense, even the Quran is a ritual because as a guy that's rational, right? The ritual the Quran, we don't term a book as a ritual. No, I mean when based on that definition. No. I mean, Let's, listen to the definition out. again. A customary okay. observance or practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a definition. A ritual is any customary observance or practice. Okay. Salat is a practice, but we don't say the Quran is a practice. So Quran doesn't fall in the criteria of a ritual. The practice you are doing is what falls in the criteria of a ritual. For instance, the ablution you have to do for Salat, chapter 5, verse 6. That alone on its own is a ritual because it didn't start from you. And any time you have to do salat, you have to do that. Do you agree? Okay, because it depends how you define salat. Because for some people, salat, okay, is a, a I, process where you explain the Quran to the people. So I'm not defining salat. Listen, I'm not okay. defining salat, Fafana. We are not even breaking okay. down salat. I'm just talking about okay. why it is a ritual. It is a ritual because it's a customary observance. It's a practice okay, you have okay. to do. Okay. I'm okay. not agreeing with the, the Shia, the Sunni, how they do their yeah, Salat. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm just saying it didn't start from us, and it is handed down by the prophets, okay. and it, get, it got to us. It's a practice. That's why God says establish okay. it. Now, okay. when something becomes an uh, observ uh, uh, customary observance, it is passed on as a religious ceremony. It keeps going because it's part of Islam. Okay. So when we say rituals, it is not about the actions and the postures, like how somebody will raise his hand, somebody will do sujood. That is not what okay. I define as a ritual. No. I okay. define the salat on how it comes down from the prophet, generation to generation, and how it like, is a summary observance that we have to observe. Okay. okay. You see? good so that's how i define it i don't define it even as a prayer i don't limit it to a prayer no yeah, now to your main question so you said why are we reciting the verses back to god now god never said we should recite the verses back to him so first of all during the Salat, it's required to read the Quran. Right? Yeah, because when you read Quran but chapter 29. You say your Salat is to, to God, my Salat, my prayer, I say my Salat is to God. Mm -hmm. During the process, you read the Quran. Uh, during the Salat, you read the Quran, and, and the Salat is for God. Mm -hmm. so it means you recite to God, right? You do Salat, look, you do Salat for God. Yes. Number one. Number two, okay. you establish Salat for the remembrance of God. Yeah, by reading the, the, the verses. Good. So within okay. Salat, there is a part where you can pray to God. B by doing what? Within Salat, there is a part you can supplicate and call on God. Tell you how the guidance works. In the Quran, chapter 3, verse 26 to 27, there is a dua there. God gave you in the verses yeah. of God. Those dua, those dua, mm. It comes from the guidance of God. That's the book of God, right? 
So if I take that dua in Quran chapter 3, verse 26 to 27, and I use it as God asked me to say it back to him, yeah. I don't see any problem with that. Does he okay. have a problem? Yeah, yeah. But my point is that because you choose to choose what the dua side of the Quran to read to God, but the requirement is that you can read all verses to God. Who said that? No, where does he say that? And who said that you have to recite the verses back to God? No, no, no. Because the Salat required to read the Quran. Right? Where, wait, wait, wait. Where, where in the Quran does it say the Salat requires? No, no, no. The Salat, no, no. The Quran, the Quran during the Salat. One of the requirements. But to who? During the Salat. Yeah, but to who? God, why I say God because we say God say your salat is to God. No, if so, so, listen, if salat is for God, doesn't mean whatever you are doing the salat has to be addressed to God. When it comes to when it comes to examples, example doesn't have a rule. When you are giving people example, there's no rule which says if you are going to give somebody example, you can't use somebody out something out of the picture to give somebody an example. Even God, mm -hmm. the one who created the heavens and the earth. He gives us example even using mosquitoes. Yeah. He gives us example using human beings. He gives us example using flies. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with examples. Example is just to give you closer understanding to the main topic of discussion. Okay. So when I use the work example, I'm just giving you that if you are told to do something, doesn't mean that thing necessarily means this is what is limited. When God says the salat is for him, because he said you should establish it. Tell me, if God didn't say we should establish salat, what are we going to establish salat for? Because when even the word established akimo, this one, the definition is uh, debatable to say it's not, it, it, it does not mean uh, established. Some say for fana. For, for fana. Okay. okay, I know, I understand everything that the Arabic, spoken Arabic and the classic and the Quranic Arabic is the same. Therefore, Arab understand fully understand the Quran. Yeah, yeah they think like that. that. Yeah, exactly, well, exactly. They don't, uh, they don't understand. Yeah, ninety yeah. percent of the Muslims. So based on that ideology, they teach more the Quran based on their understanding of the Quran. Yeah. Okay. So that's why when he says something and then you try to relate, it, so you can see it makes sense sometimes. It makes sense. So this is my following question, bro. We know that this IDC rule. Uh, uh, the the Islam based on hadith is uh, originated. I mean, from the Christian. Mm. I mean, the Christian. The Christian give this knowledge based on history. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you meet any historian, you have a discussion oh. with them. Okay. Sometimes they are the most inconsistent people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, historians. Oh like to change history sometimes because they are still like researchers so they the more they do research they update certain things you understand yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, yes so this is why god gives us the notion that don't pursue what you don't have knowledge knowledge is yeah. something any factual information that you know and you can prove that is knowledge so if you know something and you can okay. prove if i'm dealing with history books i don't equate history books with the quran no no no, no. What I do is, whatever the Quran confirms, I can rock with it. But it doesn't mean, necessarily mean I have to hold it in high esteem. No. Believing in something is different from following that thing. I believe in the Quran and its entirety, but I'm not following everything from the Quran. Does, does it make sense to you? Yeah, it makes sense to me. Because for me, we still don't understand the Quran yet. Fully understand the Quran yet. We are Good. in the process. Good. So I always agree. We always have to, you know, discover something new in the Quran. Exactly. We still don't understand yet. Exactly. So whenever there is a finding in history, I use the Quran yeah. to compare that statement. Whenever something happens in history, I take the Quran to make sure does the Quran confirm it? Because the Quran is a confirmation of what was before it. So anything which is in the past before the Quran came, Quran is here to confirm it. So if you bring me any history or information from the past, mine is just to do my research on the Quran in order to see if Quran confirms it. 
The moment oh. Quran confirms it, then I can do more research on it in order to, to put my feet there. But the oh. moment Quran doesn't, I will not pass on judgment because I have to put it aside, still waiting oh. on till I get inspired by it. So yeah. we have certain notions when people bring that to the table. If I'm well endowed in the knowledge in it, yes, I will discuss it. If I'm not well endowed, I leave it hanging as a question mark because this is something I need to look into further. To make a difference between true Islam and cultural Islam. The starting point, as the Prophet ﷺ used to say in his speeches, he would begin it after praising Allah, etc., saying, Inna asdaq al hadith kitabullah. The most truthful form of speech is the book of Allah. He would always begin with that reminder. So, this is where we need to begin. We need to get back to the Quran and to understand it and to bring it into our lives to play a primary role in our day-to-day -day lives that currently is missing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran speaking about the time of the Prophet وسلم, and of times to come. He stated in Surah Al Furqan, that's the 25th chapter, verse 30, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّي إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا The Messenger said, Allah said, the messenger said, O oh my Lord, indeed my people have boycotted this Quran. Indeed my people have boycotted this Quran. As Allah told us, Quran am ala That was Allah's reminder. Will they not? Reflect on the Quran or are their hearts closed up, locked up? Kufu is a lock. And truly today, our hearts have become locked. That is the reality of the Muslim world today. Our hearts have been locked up from the Quran. So, we need to open up our hearts. The way is through understanding the Quran, reading it, and reflecting on its meanings. Whether it is in Ramadan or outside of Ramadan, our goal is to understand the words of Allah. Better we read a little and understand a lot than to read a lot and understand little. That's, I think, obvious mathematics. We try to read and understand as much as we can. 